You mentioned the the spike in, in observations of, of, of near-Earth objects. And in the recent, um, I want to say the last few years, we've seen many successful uh, asteroid exploring spacecraft. Uh, the return of samples yeah. from the asteroid Itokawa by Japan's Hayabusa, uh, NASA's Dawn spacecraft at, uh, at Vesta, now on its way to Sirius, mm -hmm. the largest in the, the solar system. Um, and then OSIRIS-REx, uh, another NASA mission that's going to yeah. head out there uh, uh, fairly shortly. Uh, how do those, those up-close looks um, you know, help uh, your understanding uh, about just what asteroids are and, and you know, how they could be addressed mm -hmm. if, if they did pose a threat, what we could do to mitigate that threat? Right. Well, when I was in school, mind you, that was quite a while ago, uh, asteroids were whirling rocks, and so, you know, but when the, we first got our spacecraft observations of these objects, we realized that they weren't really solid rocks at all. They're, uh, most of them are what we call rubble piles that are held together by little more than their own self-gravity. Um, the first, uh, one of the first asteroids that we flew past with the Galileo spacecraft was called Matilde, mm -hmm. and it turned out to have a bulk density of 1.3 grams per cubic centimeter, which is just a little more than water itself. So if this thing were just a slightly bit less dense, it would float <laughs> in a bowl of water, which was a big surprise. Uh, so asteroids have gone from whirling rocks to underdense, uh, very porous rubble piles as a rule. So that's important if we find one that's on an Earth-threatening mm -hmm. trajectory because uh, it makes a big difference on whether you're smacking into a rock or whether you're burying your spacecraft into a very porous pile of sand type uh, asteroid. Okay. How, um, how important uh, is the size of, of a, 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 an asteroid in, in terms of its role as a, a potentially hazardous uh, object, a, a threat? Uh, uh, you know, we, I think most people may be aware of the, the asteroid that ended the dinosaurs, yeah. and, and they think of a, that when they think of an asteroid impact, but the, it seems like there are several different types of, 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 of threats when, when you're looking at the, these objects. Right, I, uh, an object that is uh, larger than two or three kilometers or a mile or two in, in diameter would be capable of causing global problems mm -hmm. should it hit. The one that wiped out the dinosaurs was about six miles in diameter, huge. Uh, but over time, these objects keep smacking into each other, so mm -hmm. the big ones get smaller and, and more numerous, uh, creating much more numerous smaller ones. So as time goes by, the entire population gets smaller but more numerous small ones. So we don't have as, nearly as many large ones anymore. Uh, and the ones that are a kilometer and larger, we found 95% of them, none of them represent a threat. So now we're looking to complete the survey or get 90% of the 140 meter sized objects and larger, because those are the objects that, should they hit in the ocean, would cause tsunamis. Mm -hmm. If they were to hit on land, they would cause regional uh, devastation. So. NASA's next goal is to find 90% of that population, and then once we find 90% of that population, we'll probably move on to the smaller ones that could cause uh, uh, less regional damage, but would hit more often. Well, and, and that, that, that's a, that brings up another point for just the general public. How worried should they be that on any given day, when they go outside, you know, they might be at risk at that uh, <laughs> uh, of, of an impact? I mean, most of us just you know get up in the morning and go outside to work. <laughs> <laughs> well. I don't think anyone should lose sleep over this problem, frankly. Uh, we found 95% of the large ones, none of them represent a threat. We've got about 40% uh, discovery re rate of the 140 meter sized objects. Uh, the 30 meter sized objects we haven't found, but 1% or so of them, but uh, those are the objects that would most likely hit every uh, few hundred years. Uh, most likely hit in the ocean, would cause no problem. Most likely hit in an uninhabited area, no problem. And NASA is actually developing a telescope mm -hmm. so called the ATLAS system, which is extremely wide field, looks at the entire accessible sky a couple times a night, and will be able to find these 30 meter sized objects several weeks in advance of an impact. And if one of them should be targeted for an inhabited area, we would simply uh, evacuate the area. For perspective's sake, you mentioned in, in your book that uh, on an average, there's a hundred tons of just material, yeah. uh, you know, pieces, bits of, of, of grain, you know, to, that hit the earth every day. I mean, yeah. that, that, that's just mind-boggling. Uh, I mean, how much stuff is actually out there? 
Well, there's yeah, I mean, we get 100 tons uh, come into the Earth's atmosphere every day, but it's mostly in the, in the form of uh, pea-sized objects, about that, like that. So they don't make it through the Earth's atmosphere. Mm -hmm. They cause meteors, shooting stars. Everyone sees those from time to time. I mean, basketball-sized objects come in daily. They cause fireball events. Volkswagen-sized objects come in every few weeks. Again, they just form uh, fireball events. Mm -hmm. They don't cause any ground damage. So they have to get to be 30 meters or larger before they can cause any real damage. Do you have um, a favorite uh, uh, near-Earth object or asteroid just in the, the years of observation or, or that you're most anticipating when they, when they fly by? Um, I mean, is there one that really just, that you, you really want to know what it looks like and, and what it's made of uh, when, when it zips by? Well, we've got uh, the OSIRIS-REx mission, which is actually going to a C-type asteroid, which is made up of carbon-based materials, perhaps water ice. We've got the ha Japanese Hayabusa 2 mission, which is also going to a C-type asteroid. And both of these missions are designed to bring samples back to Earth, where we can get the electron microscopes and all this very sophisticated equipment to understand what is the chemical composition of these objects, how much uh, hydrated minerals are there, what is the potential for mining them for, for water resources in the future. So these two missions are really kind of exciting to me and, uh, and to the scientific community as well. I, I did want to ask you uh, about a different type of object, uh, a comet, uh, a comet Ison, uh, which we've been hearing about um, uh, with great anticipation. Um, you know, we know that it's going to come by for a close approach to the sun uh, in November. Uh, I'm wondering what you think of, of, of the comet, its potential to be uh, an eye-catching site for folks on Earth and uh, you know what we could learn. Well, Comet Ison uh, is, is probably, almost certainly, going to put out a heck of a show uh, about November, December of, of this year. Uh, actually, it reaches its closest point to the sun on Thanksgiving Day <laughs> of this year, which is nice. Uh, so it's, it's getting so close to the sun that the water ices and the other ices that are interior to this comet will be vaporizing dramatically, throwing off the embedded dust particles and putting on a, a huge tail as a rule. So if you look in the western horizon after the sun sets in the west, wait a, a few, uh, half an hour or so for twilight to turn to darkness and then look for the tail stretching up from the western horizon. It should be very impressive. Uh, However, uh, I hasten to note that I'm old enough to remember Comet Kohotek in 1973, which was advertised as the comet of the century. It turned out to fizzle. Mm -hmm. So comets are notoriously difficult to predict in terms of their behavior. So while it's a very good chance that this comet will put on a heck of a light show, a uh, celestial light show, there's always a chance that it'll just fizzle. <laughs> Well, let's hope not, <laughs> but but uh, but it's good to keep in mind, uh, and uh, and thank you so much. Again, uh, mm -hmm. our guest today was uh, uh, Dr. Don Yeomans, um, head of NASA's uh, Near Earth Object uh, Program Office at uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. His uh, book is Near Earth Objects: Finding Them Before They Find Us. And uh, thanks so much for for coming out and spending some time with us, Don. My pleasure. Space.com.